Come on, can you give God glory tonight? Come on, lift it up to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. And, and I just want to declare, I feel the Holy Spirit even saying this. Get ready because this is not going to be a normal weekend. Even for some of you who've been to ramp conferences, I just even feel by the Spirit of the Lord. Get ready because what is on this weekend is unusual. And, and I feel like we're even stepping into uh, a new place in God, a new season, even within the body of Christ. Uh, and I just even want to declare this over you. Even uh, during worship, I heard the Lord say this. I want to release it to you, youth pastors, youth leaders, parents. I heard the Lord say that the days of plowing Gen Z is over and the time of harvest is here. Come on, the days of having to pull them along in prayer and pull them along in worship. I want to declare a shift is taking place in the hearts of this generation. Revival is breaking forth in Gen Z. We're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost like never before. And get ready because when you go back to church on Sunday and you go back to church next week, you're going to have a different youth group. Amen. And, and young people, I want uh, you to understand too the, the significance of the hour. You know, I had a dream uh, early Sunday morning. Uh, and in the dream, uh, I was with uh, actually the Ramps Youth Group. Where's Ramp, Ramp, Ramp Youth? Wave at us. Love you, Ramp Youth. We're, they're spread all over. Yeah, there's some up here too. I was with them. We were in a house. And we were in this house in the dream. And an alert goes off on my phone. You know, you know those uh, intense emergency alarms that scare you? you know you're like, like whoa what's going on like amber alert or silver alert or whatever and you know all of a sudden uh one of those goes off and i know we're we're under attack as a nation in the dream i knew it was russia attacking us actually i knew that war had broken out that literally we were under attack as a nation so i get the youth group we run downstairs into this bomb shelter type basement and uh, I remember looking out the window and the sky was full of thousands of those stealth fighter bomber jets. Literally, the sky was just darkened with them coming in. And then bombs begin to fall. Glass was breaking. We all dove on the ground. Um, and and uh, this is actually a true fact. This is, you know, happened during World War II. Uh, when Germany would do air raids uh, on Britain at night, they would have to turn off all their lights so that it would not signify to the enemy where they were. And so I ran upstairs because I knew lights were on. And as I began to go through room to room turning lights off, I walk into a bedroom and there's a teenager laying in bed sound asleep. The TV was playing and he was just sound asleep with every light on. And I remember in the dream, literally bombs are going off. Death is imminent if we do not get to shelter. And I begin to shake him and say, what are you doing? Wake up. We've got to go. And I remember he even kind of sat up. He was confused. His hair was all messed up. And I remember pulling him out of bed and we ran to shelter and I woke up. And listen, this is what I'm going to declare over you. You need to wake up and realize that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And listen, if the enemy can get you asleep, and if he can distract you with the things of this world, he has you exactly where he wants you. You need to come in here this weekend, not with a heart that you're just here to have fun, and maybe, you know, I might raise my hands a little bit. No, you need to come in here with a heart hungry for God, and a heart to say, God, whatever you want to do in me, I'm here. Listen, this ain't the conference for you to be cute. When the game's at, we don't got them. When are we, where, where's the after party? There's not one. The after party is you and your youth group getting hit at the Holy Ghost at the Holiday Inn and you can't pick yourself up off the parking lot. That's the after party. Listen, you're here to encounter God and you will never be the same again. This isn't that conference for you to try to look cool in front of everybody else. New flash, you're not, you're not cool. I'm not cool. Girls, don't even worry about getting ready before service. You're going to cry all your makeup off. 
This ain't that conference where you try to look cool in front of your friends. Listen, you got permission to move aside, to, to go somewhere and encounter Jesus and give God a high praise and give him your best and give him your best worship. It's time for you to wake up. And, and I, I feel this even this weekend as we're getting started and we're jumping in. Uh, I want to share a word with you that even over the past few days has just been stirring in my heart uh, that I want to release to you. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter number 15. Luke 15. I'm actually going to start in verse 1 because it sets the tone for the, really the entire chapter. It says, Then all the tax collectors, I love this, and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And, and I, listen, I believe that, that though even the way that is worded is significant because James says this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so literally it's setting a tone to say this. I, I know there's stuff going on in your life. I know you're struggling. I know you got issues. I know you're jacked up. But can I tell you that Jesus, his heart is for you to draw near to him. It says that they begin to draw near to him. And uh, verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes complain, saying, this man receives. That word receives also welcomes. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And he begins to share some parables. What a man of you... Having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost, listen to this, until he finds it. That is who our Jesus is. He's not going to stop. He's not, he, he's not going to let up pursuing you until he finds it. And listen. I'm not even preaching on these. I just like them. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice for me, uh, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Verse 8, or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I'm going to start preaching on verse 11, but I, this is the precedent he's setting up. Jesus is seeking after the lost things. His passion, his heart, his heart's desire is for the lost to be found. That's why you are here. That's why he's brought you here to the woods of Alabama is because you are lost and need to be found. Let, let's talk about verse 11. You know this story, but I, I want you to hear it. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he had come to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to eat and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But listen to this. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf there and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this son who was dead is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry come on give God praise for that listen I know that this is a story you've probably heard before but I want to share it in a fresh way because I begin to see your generation in this story and, and I, I begin to, as I begin to read on this and meditate this, because if we were to be honest, it's most likely you're no stranger to church. You probably grew up in church. You probably know the VeggieTales song by heart. <laughs> you know, you went to VBS. You've been to Winter Jam. You've done all the churchy stuff. And yet you still find within your heart something in you that is prone to wander. Something in you that's prone to wander. And we, you know, we've, we've had these statistics, especially for my millennial generation. Now we're hearing him for a Gen Z generation. But we've heard the statistics saying, you know, and, and I'm tired of hearing it, of, of so many t- young people leave the faith after they graduate high school. So many young people become prodigals and they leave the church. They leave the faith. Can I tell you, I'm done with that statistic. And listen, I believe now is the time. We're going to break that statistic in the name of Jesus. Listen, we're going to go after prodigals. But can I tell you, we're going to prevent prodigals. Because when people taste and see that the Lord is good, they won't have a desire to leave. So they, 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 they would leave. And I begin to ponder, why, why, why would he leave? And, and what's the significance of this? And, and I, as I begin to pray and meditate on this, I begin to see that, that, that prodigals have come to love the Father for what He can do for them rather than the Father Himself. And as long as we have a consumer society within the body of Christ, we will have a prodigal generation. As long as people come to church and say, what can you do for me? This is for me. Worship better be on my terms. You better sing the songs I like. You better do it in my time period so I can go to Golden Corral after. And if, and, and if pastor, you don't entertain me, I'm going to get bitter and offended. Well, the pastor down the road shot himself out of a cannon last week. <laughs> this weekend, the great, you know, the monster truck's going to drive over everybody's car in the parking lot. Church ain't meant to entertain you. Worship's not entertainment. Listen, this ain't a spectator sport. He's called you to worship. He's called you to pray. He's called you to go after him. And as long as people have the mindset to say, God, yeah, 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 you're really awesome, but what can you do for me? He's missing the entire point. Can, can I tell you that the Father is the inheritance? That even he spoke to Abraham and said, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And listen, we've got to get to the place where we say, God, I'm not just looking for your hand. I'm looking for your face. I'm not looking just for how you can bless me and I'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field and and da 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 and all that stuff. No, God, I just want you and nothing else. What if we really meant that song when we sang it? Oh, nothing else. I just want you. What if we really meant that with all of our heart? He missed it. He was in the Father's house and he loved the goods more than he loved the Father. He wanted his inheritance. How can I prove that? As soon as he got the inheritance, he left. And listen, that's where we even got to search our hearts because I've even, I've seen people do it before. They say, I want peace. I just want peace. I just want peace. I just want joy. You can't have peace without the Prince of Peace. We can't separate the two. It's not like, Lord, give me my peace and I'll be good. No, no, no. I encounter Jesus and he is my peace. He he is my peace. He's the one who takes away my anxiety and fills me with the joy of the Lord. I'm not just wanting what he can do for me. And can I tell you, that's why you're here this weekend. is so that you can taste and see that the Lord is good. That you can encounter the love of the Father. Because when you encounter the love of the Father, that wandering heart will be broken. He said, give me, give me my inheritance. And even by him saying that, inheritances are only received after the father dies. So he was saying to him, in essence, I could care less about you. Give me my stuff. I could care less about being in your presence. 
I want your stuff. I, 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 I want the miracles. I, I, I want what you can do for me. But in reality, God has called you to know him. He's called you into relationship. He's called you into covenant. Well, because we see this, when he begins to receive things, the Bible says that he leaves and spends it all on riotous living. Now, just to be honest, I don't even know what riotous living means. But he must have threw down. Like, bro, we've had some good times, but none of us have, like, been guilty of riotous living. Some of y'all have, but, I mean, that's like, <laughs> yo, like, what in the world? I, I, I was trying to study the word. The word is so vague, it just means, like, careless spending and just recklessness. Bro, can you imagine what his Instagram stories must have been like? <laughs> Dude, he just living it up, partying. Even further on, he, he, literally he, he says he's spending on prostitutes. He's, you know, he's buying the Gucci slides. Come on. <laughs> buying the J's. I like just looking fresh. And, and it's so interesting because it, set, it, it gives us such a clear picture of the world. I'm so thankful for the Bible that it shows us where... Walking away from the Lord will ultimately lead you. Because even as he began to live crazy, and, and it's so interesting too because you find him, he's got a lot of money, he's living it up, he's buying everybody's drinks, he's partying. But something interesting happens. The Bible says there arose a severe famine in the land and he became to be in want. Which meant... He went to go swipe his debit card. Don't you act like you have not been there before. Yo, you want to talk about panic attack. You go to swipe. And you know they say it loud. They're like, sir, it says decline. It's like, lower your voice. And you have to be like, oh, goodness, that's weird. Must be something wrong with, let me transfer from my unusually large savings account. You're just sweating. <laughs> he, he, he's living it up, he's having fun, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's a, savan, uh, a, a severe famine in the land, and he reaches into his pocket, and there's nothing there anymore. Listen, the Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season. Sin is pleasurable for a season. You know, the, you can, I, I've seen it happen so many times. You start dating someone. All my life, I pray for someone like you. I thank God that I, that I finally found you. You're like 14, but you're singing KC and JoJo. I don't know nothing about KC and JoJo. Crazy, 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 just the thinking. Like, it's like you love so deep. It's like, we're in it for the, I've been looking at houses on Zillow. <laughs> Saving for a down payment. And I got $13.74. We're going to get married. The relationship's good. You start crossing boundaries. Next thing you know, you're doing stuff you never thought you would be doing. You slowly find yourself from talking in the front seat to hanging out in the back seat. And I've seen it happen so many times. A relationship that was just, we're just, well, we're, everything's so great, turns into terror. Why? Because sin is pleasurable for a season. The, the, the drinking and partying lifestyle is fun for a season until and I'm telling you there's always an until until it turns on you because that's how sin deceives us sin loves to trick us into thinking we're into con in control until we go to say no and we can't say no 
Sin wants to tell you we're together in this. I'm doing this for you and we're doing this together and this is all about fun and experiencing life. And then all of a sudden you choose to stop and you can't. And you drinking with the boys on the weekend turns into it you being an alcoholic at 28 years old. What started off as just an innocent thing that I'm not going to play games with. Listen, sin is never innocent. Sin will trick you into thinking it's something little. I remember when I first I got exposed to pornography at a young age. And I remember having that feeling of it's not a big deal. I mean, I can stop whenever I want to stop until I tried to stop. And I couldn't. And the thing that I kept in the hidden nobody else knew about was destroying me internally. I remember going to church, playing the game, looking like the good youth group kid, raising my hands during Agnes Day. Come on, that's like early 2000s. You know, being that guy, worshiping, going after God. But on the inside, I was a slave to sin. Sin was my master. And that's where we find him. He's living his best life. He's loving everything. Everything's great. And then the Bible says, A severe famine hit, and he began to be in want. And notice what happens even in that place. Everybody that called them friends to him were suddenly gone. He began to be in want. Listen, I believe that there's those moments, and I remember having my moment as a teenager, where a severe famine hit my spirit. Raised in a good church home. Everything's great. You know, every, great family, great church. I was comfortable. I was sleeping. I was, I was sound asleep in my complacency until Jonah sailed into a storm. And listen, I I believe that some of you are in that place where everything's been great right up until something shifted. I remember being in that place of living in hidden sin, drinking, partying, living a crazy lifestyle until I hit the place of rock bottom. Listen, your wandering from the Lord will never lead you up. It will always lead you down. You will always, 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 always find yourself hurting and broken, and just like him, sitting in a pigsty. Remember, listen, listen what it says right here. So, so interesting, so heartbreaking. It says this, he spent all their rose, famine, and lamb, he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Pigs were commonly known and still are in in, in Jewish culture as being unclean. They would have nothing to do. They would not eat pig meat. They wouldn't do anything like that. And and he found himself, what he would have normally abstained from, he was now living in uncleanness. What normally he told himself, I'll never go there. I'll never let myself, I'll never let it get that bad. He all of a sudden one day woke up and found himself sitting surrounded by filth. The Bible says he longed. There was a hunger that began to stir on the inside of him. Can, can I just tell you right now, I know, I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what you're battling with. Everybody's story looks a little bit different. But can I tell you that within every single one of our hearts, there comes a moment where hunger begins to rise. Where a desperation, I remember being in that place of desperation. I didn't even know what I was crying out for. I just remember laying in bed one night with tears streaming down my face, just saying, God, if you're real, I want to know you. I believe you're here tonight, even in the midst of whatever you're going through, and there's a hunger stirring on the inside of you. It says he began to be in want, he longed. To fill himself with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But verse 17, and I want to declare this over you. But when he came to himself, can I tell you that stuff you've been doing is not who you are. The way you've been living, 
the way you've been acting out, the things you've been chasing, the things of the world you've been living for. I want to declare for you that's not who you are. Every wrong identity of the enemy breaks off of you in the name of Jesus. You're not going to live bound by pornography for the rest of your life. You're not going to live with confusion in your mind for the rest of your life. You are made to party. You are made for alcohol. You are made for the glory of God. You are made to know him. He came to himself. And I want to speak right now, right through that shell that you got, and right through that church mask, and I want to say it's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to come to yourself. You don't got to play games anymore. You can get real. He came to himself and began to realize, listen, because what had happened was is I, 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 I've had encounters with God before I begin to walk astray and live a lifestyle of bondage and, and, and party and all that. I've had encounters with God, and I knew something on the inside of me was saying, this isn't who I'm called to be. She says he, he, he came to himself, and he said, he, he rose, came to himself, and said, I will go to my father. Now listen, this is, what I want, this is what I want to talk to you about because, listen, you know there's junk in your life. But I want to tell you the Father's response tonight to your junk. He said he has all this stuff. And, and listen, let me, let me say this real quick. Even before he, get, he, he decides to go back, he says, I'll rise, I'll go to my Father, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. Boom. That's major and this generation's got to get this. There comes a moment in your life where you got to stop faking it till you make it. Listen, this is that place where you don't have to act like you got it all together. We see it every Thursday night of these conferences. I'm good. How are you, brother? Blessed and highly favored. (laughs) Above only and and not beneath. I did a skit to I Can Only Imagine three years ago at Easter. I'm wonderful. You know? Or we don't take ownership of the fact that I'm living in sin. We say words like, well, I stumbled into it. Y'all, why do we do that to the Lord? Even our prayers of repentance are soft and weak. He, pff, what? Lord, my bad. I mean, I kind of did this. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but not really. So, and it wasn't my fault, Lord. It was her. We pull an Adam. Lord, it's the woman you gave to me. You see what she did, Lord? She done deceived me. We, we love to blame it. On everywhere, everybody around us. Because we think for some reason that we can't come to God. And the Bible, we, we, we feel like we have to hide it. We feel like we got to put on a show to God. But can I tell you, at the altars, you need to come and get real. At the altars, you don't need to play any more games. You need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, it's me. I did it. I messed up. I gave in. I went too far. I said this. I've been doing this. You come to the Lord. Confess your sins to the Lord for he is faithful and just to cleanse you all of your unrighteousness. Don't sugarcoat when you confess your sins to the Lord. He said, I am a sinner. He he creates this whole long drawn out prayer that he's going to tell his father. Verse 20, he arose and came to his father. Just imagine that. Just just put yourselves in the shoes of the prodigal. Here he is. He spent all of his livelihood. Everything his father had given him, he wasted. He has nothing left. He's literally covered in filth. He's covered in filth. His hair's messed up. He's literally got feces and mud caked all over his body. Listen, that was probably a really long walk for him. Going over through his mind. Okay, Father, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But what if he rejects me? But no, no, no. He needs more servants. So maybe, you know, I, I know I blew the title as son. I know I blew the daughter, the, the title as daughter. But I know maybe he'll just let me be a slave. And, and can you imagine to his surprise as he's walking what he encounters? 
And I feel that even from some of you tonight. You came in here tonight and you were ready. It's like I watch it every single conference. You come in and you want to go after God, but you feel like you got to wait until you answer the first altar call. You've done it before. It's like, well, I got to get saved before I can really go after God. And maybe, maybe, just maybe he'll receive me the way I am. Maybe, just maybe something will happen. But can I tell you, the Bible says that as he goes, this paints the picture of the love of the Father. Listen to you. Say to me. me. You've got to understand it. Say to me. me. You've got to understand this. This is what Jesus is saying the Father is like. While he was still a far way off. The son was way down the road. And listen, this is what he was showing us. The father was watching the entire time. The father was waiting. Listen, he stood guard on that porch every day, every night. People came to him and said, you know, uh, just just go about your business. He's coming back. But I tell you, the father was standing and waiting. Can I tell you that the father's been waiting for this moment for you? He's been waiting for this moment where you would load up in a church van and drive halfway across the country to pull into a town of 6,000 people, to walk into a crowded room, to sit on a piece of carpet just so he can welcome you home. While he was still a far way off, he ran. Listen, I'm going to just tell you two things about the love of the Father. Listen, the first thing is this, especially for this generation. The love of the Father destroys shame and guilt. The love of the Father destroys shame and guilt. Listen to what he did. Listen to what happened right here. He literally goes, as he is still a far way off, his father saw him had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's who your father is. He is a running, hugging, rejoicing, kissing father that longs for you to be in his presence. Listen, he, he runs to him and he begins to wrap his arms around him in love. Now, if... In my natural mind, I would expect for when I would, after doing all that crazy stuff, riotous living, you know, my father, my dad's like standing on the front porch with a crock ready to rear me out. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) With a chonkla, you know, like it's about to get bad. Like, Like that's, that in my natural mind is what would happen or him to to simply just be disappointed and angry and disgusted by my filth. And you keep your distance until you clean yourself up and then we'll talk. But can I tell you, the father is not intimidated by your dirt. He's not intimidated by what you've done. He's not intimidated by your secrets. He's not scared of it. Listen, there's a story of the man with leprosy. Literally, this man's skin's rotting off, falling off. If anybody touches him, he'd be unclean. He runs to Jesus and says, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus didn't say, well, sir, go be blessed and we'll pray about it. (laughs) Fill out a connect card and we'll get back to you, okay? Just don't come near. The Bible says, he, Jesus responds and says, I am willing. And he doesn't just stop there. He touches him. Sorry. He touches him and he's supernaturally healed. What does that show me? Listen, when you come into the presence of the Lord, whatever impurities are in you, listen, the pure one overtakes the impurities. The clean one, the holy one, overtakes the uncleanness in your life. When you come into the presence of the Lord, listen, His power overtakes it. He's not intimidated by it. Well, you don't know what I did. You're right, I don't, but He does, and He's not scared of it. You don't know my deepest, darkest secrets. I know, and I don't want to know. But He does, and He still says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He runs. He hugs him. He begins to kiss him. Worship team, and go ahead and come on up. Listen, he's not, he's not intimidated by what you're going through. He's not intimidated by your bondage. He's not intimidated by how long you've been bound by this. He wants to set you free. 
Listen, the second thing is this. The Father's love releases identity. The Father's love releases true identity. Because what did He do? He, he hugged Him. He kisses Him. He begins to say that thing of, Father, I'm not even worthy to be called Your Son anymore. Just make me one of Your hired servants. The Father doesn't even acknowledge that. And what does He say? Go get me the best robe. Don't, don't go get me a great value robe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't, don't go get me the best. You go find the best robe and bring it to my son. Listen, I know you feel dirty. I know you feel unclean. I know you, those sins. Because here's the, here's so, what's so interesting is the enemy, more than anything, wants to identify you by your issue. For years, I lived under the shadow of that, of, oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just bound by lust. This is just who I am. But can I tell you that when Jesus came, listen, and here's another thing, too. I don't have to look to the world to identify me anymore. The Father identifies. The Bible says that we have died and our lives are now hidden with Christ. He comes. He wraps a robe around him. And listen, I, I have to read Zechariah 4. I have to read Zechariah 4. So powerful. I love what it says right here. Because I feel this so strongly. You know what? Just throw it up on the screen. I'm going to... Yeah, here, wait. Here we go. Zechariah 4. Verse 1. Listen, I think this is such a beautiful picture of what happens when you're filthy and you're covered in dirt. Listen. Zechariah's having a vision. And he goes on. I'm sorry, in chapter 3. It says, Now then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke and said, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I've removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Listen, I know you're coming to the Father, you're filthy, you're dirty, there's all this stuff and yet he clothes you in his righteousness. For he that knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not only that, he says, go get a ring and bring it to him. And the ring was so significant because the ring carried the family crest. And this is what he was saying. I know you feel like you're not worthy anymore to be called my son, but bring a ring because you're my son. Bring a ring, put it on their finger. You're my son. Listen, I feel tonight the love of Jesus, the love of the Father that's here. And it's going to destroy every ounce of shame in your life. Because here's the deal. He, he doesn't just leave us in our filth. He cleanses us. He washes us. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Come and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them white as wool. He's not going to leave you filthy. He's not going to leave you in your bondage. He's not going to leave you in your sin. All you have to do is come home. All you have to do is come back to the Father. I don't care how long you've been away. I don't care how bad it is. All you have to do is come home. Come on, aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of the pig pen? Aren't you tired of living in the field? Are you tired of the shame and the guilt and the condemnation that weighs on you and the accusations of the enemy and the confusion? Aren't you tired of it? Listen, I want to tell you, your father, he's standing on the porch watching. Listen, very quietly, just stand all over the room. Keep this a holy atmosphere. Don't talk, don't talk. Leaders, just begin to pray in the spirit. Come on, just begin to pray in the spirit. Listen, 
when you stand very quietly take about five steps back come on leaders there's some kids on the line tonight that there's some prodigals coming home tonight listen I want you to look at me look at me you're here tonight say man if I were to be honest I, I, I've been living in that place of filth I've been living in sin hidden sin nobody else knows about but me these thoughts are tormenting me and tonight I want to encounter this father I want to encounter my heavenly father that's been waiting for me that's been watching for me that wants to clothe me in his righteousness who wants to identify me as his child listen if that's you right now I want you to run to this altar right now come on come to the Lord come on come home come on come home come on I know your friends think you're doing just fine push to the crowd come to the altar oh come on come on pastor's kid Come on, pastor's kid, you can come down here. He's waiting for you. Come on, pastor's kid, I know you've been struggling. Come on, you can come to the Lord tonight. Oh, come on, come on, they're still coming. Push through the crowd, push through the crowd. Listen, when you get to the altar, just begin to call on the name of the Lord. Just begin to call on the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, come on. Open up your mouth. Begin to call on the name of the Lord. There's still more. There's still more. Listen, push through the crowd. Keep coming. There's still more. You're fighting that feeling. Your heart's beating in your chest. The Lord is saying, come home. Come home. Come home tonight. Come on, he's waiting for you. Lord, I declare the love of the oh, Father released right now. The altar, the come on, all over the room, lift up those hands.